Hello, and welcome to this video on pumpkins. My name is Christy, and I'm the agronomy agent with Colorado State University here in Pueblo County. It's getting close to Halloween now, and so I thought it would be fun to share a little bit about one of the coolest fruits that really almost has its own season. So today, let's get to it. As a note, extension programs are available to all without discrimination. Everybody probably knows what a pumpkin is, but really, what is a pumpkin? They're a warm season vegetable. Well, actually, they're a berry fruit, if you want to get technical. Uh, but they are the symbolic item we think of most often during fall and around Halloween. Oftentimes, they can also be referred to as a gourd, a squash, or a melon. So who are pumpkins related to? Well, they're part of the cucurbit family, and C. pepo is the very typical and most commonly known or thought of round-shaped, orange-colored pumpkin. There are so many different types of pumpkins, from tiny to giant, multicolored, different striped ones, bumpy and lumpy ones. A whole bunch of different species of pumpkins. So C. pepo is the most common one, but there's also C. maxima, C. mashaka. A whole bunch of different species um, have been derived to have a whole bunch of different cultivars, or also known as different varieties or different types. Um, and these different cultivar cultivars have been developed and bred most oftentimes for their looks and their aesthetics. So we want them to look a certain way and we want different colors and different uh, shapes. But some have also been bred for for eating, for, for the different food types and stuffs that we can get from pumpkin. A few different cultivars include baby bear, which is a really tiny pumpkin, harvest moon, which is a somewhat of an intermediate pumpkin that weighs probably somewhere between 10 and 15 pounds. Autumn Gold, Jumpin' Jack, Kentucky Filled, and this one, Kentucky Filled is one that's actually more of an eating pumpkin. You can, they actually make um, canned pumpkin out of Kentucky Filled and Dixon Filled. Um, and then Mammoth Gold, which is one of those really giant, giant ones. Let's take a, a quick historic perspective on the pumpkin. Um, I'll look at, at what used to be. So uh, indigenous people domesticated pumpkins around 7,500 years ago in the Oaxa, o Oaxaca highlands of Mexico. So they're very, they're native to Central America and indigenous people have been growing and eating pumpkins for thousands of years. Um, they're a really important food staple because of their high nutritional value and very importantly, their ability to last through winter. Uh, pumpkins, uh, along with some other root vegetables and crops, would be able to stave off starvation, basically, through the winter. Well, well, things couldn't grow because that hard rind that's around them really just keeps the flesh on the inside pretty stable. As long as nothing punctures the pumpkin or can get in or get out, the pumpkin on the inside can stay stay pretty good and the flesh is edible and the seeds are edible. Um, more often though, they were grown for their flesh as opposed to their seeds that eating the seeds is kind of developed um, in the later centuries. Other things indigenous people did was to dry uh, strips of pumpkin and then they wove them into mats and made various things out of those dried strips. Uh, basically they saved the colonists lives <laughs> oftentimes again for their good long-term storage abilities and, you know, eating them. Definitely not the sweet melons that colonists may have been used to coming from the old world, coming from uh, Europe and the, the Mediterranean, um, but definitely something that was edible and that was a good food staple.
today we use pumpkins much more versatilely. Um, we don't necessarily eat them in their raw form quite as much. Uh, we can use them probably most often for carving, um, but also de often for decorating. Now, being a symbol of fall, pumpkins are often used as a, a fun tool or a, another a nice item to set out on the porch or um, do, do various things with. Of course, there's always the option to eat pumpkins, um, whether you do something savory with a pumpkin and chunk it up and put it into a stew or mush it up and make it into a pie, you know, whatever you like to do, there, there is the option to eat them. Um, one of my favorite options, though, is to pump for pumpkin chunking. Uh, it's uh, basically when you catapult or launch pumpkins into the air, see how far they can fly, and then, of course, they go smooshy, smooshy once they hit the ground. It's great fun. So pumpkins in Pueblo are, it's a really important crop in Pueblo. Um, approximately 500 to 700 acres of pumpkins are grown annually. This is a lot of pumpkins. Uh, they're sold retail, they're sold wholesale, um, one of the major export crops for the county. So these pumpkins, you know, farmers are growing them all over trying to get as many pumpkins to grow as they can. They've got pumpkin patches every year in the fall all these great things. And then not every pumpkin gets sold or used or eaten or carved. And so there are leftovers and cute little cows and other livestock animals love the delicious treat of a pumpkin. And so uh, oftentimes farmers with cows and let those cows out into their pumpkin fields where the leftovers pumpkins are. And the cows just kind of mushes it with their foot and their hoof and nibbles on on that tasty pumpkin. It's a great treat, has good nutritional value, has a lot of good water storage. So cows cows gain quite a bit and helps the farmers kind of recycle leftover pumpkins, especially here in Pueblo. So how do you grow pumpkins? How do, how do they grow? What do they do? What do you need to do to grow them? Um, like I said, they're a warm season vegetable, and they take anywhere from 85 to 120 days to reach full maturity when you're planting from seed. And they can grow pretty well in most all type of soils, but they do need a lot of room to grow. They can get really big and spread really wide. And so uh, you should, when you're planting your pumpkin seeds, you should plant them and then thin them out so that there's about three feet between each plant in a row. And then you should probably leave about six feet of space in between each row. This allows the pumpkin's vines to spread out and not have to compete with other plants for resources like sun and growing room, right? It really gives the pumpkin um, room to, to really just do its thing and, and get out there. Roots of pumpkins can grow really deep into the ground. And this actually helps them to be a bit more drought tolerant and resilient. Um, and so when you're irrigating pumpkins in a crop, you want to water deeply and infrequently. This helps to meet the needs of those, this plant's roots. And this method of irrigating can actually also help to reduce the occurrence of diseases that are spread by water and high levels of surface moisture. So that, that infrequent watering means that the, kind of the top two, three inches of soil stays dry. And that helps to lessen the spread of disease while there's still plenty of moisture in the subsoil so that those roots get all that moisture and keep growing that plant, keep growing that pumpkin. Uh, planting date really actually depends on your growing season, but in our area, in Pueblo, pumpkins should be planted from the beginning to the, about the middle of June. That's kind of the window you want to make sure you get your, your pumpkins planted in. Um, and then this will help to make sure that they are ready for the season, that they're ready for October, which is really the popular season or be has become the popular season for, for pumpkins. Now you want to harvest your pumpkins when they have completely changed color. So they're going to start out as a greeny kind of color, whether it's light green or dark green, they'll, they'll be somewhat of a greeny color and then they'll kind of start morphing as they mature into their different color, orange, white, yellow, whatever that that color happens to be. Um, but you know that they're mature once the entire pumpkin has turned color. And then also 
you can tell it's mature if the skin or the the rind, right, the heart is the shell basically around the, the pumpkin flesh is hard and resists a finger, fingernail puncture. Pumpkins are fairly resilient and they don't get taken down by disease or pest too often or too harshly. Oftentimes we see um, boisterous crops of pumpkins year after year after year, but there are some pests and diseases that can get to pumpkins and really cause some trouble. Uh, Phytophthora blight, which is the pictured pumpkin, the pumpkin that looks kind of all moldy at the bottom there. Um, it's a fungal pathogen that affects all parts of the pumpkin plant and fruit. So it can affect the leaves, it can affect the stems and the vines, it can affect the, the fruit pumpkin itself, which is what the picture is showing. Um, and the bad thing with this one is, unfortunately, the spores of this fungus can overwinter in the soil, and then that'll cause, and then infection will get stirred up again the next season um, when the right weather conditions come on. And most often, it we'll see fungal diseases working this way, and, and really they're brought on when there's a period of wet weather, and that's then followed by some warm and dry weather. Oftentimes, we'll see a fungal disease is starting to, to catch on. Um, another disease is bacterial wilt, and this one's spread by the striped and spotted cucumber beetles. So those little yellow, tiny, yellow and black striped beetles, those darn things. Um, <laughs> it's not as common of a disease seen here. It, it does happen once in a while, but not nearly as common. Um, but the, the insect itself can be a major pest, which is unfortunate. Watermelon mosaic virus can have detrimental effects to a pumpkin crop if infection gets started while the plants are still young and, and gets started early, it can really get its grips in there. And that possibly could decrease yields by 75% or more. So that really would be a crop loss at that point. Um, any kind of mosaic virus, cucurbit plants, so that's really anything that's pumpkins, cucumbers, squashes, gore, all of these gourds, all of these kinds of things are really, really susceptible to, to mosaic viruses. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different mosaic viruses. And, and really, especially, you know, if infection gets in there early and quickly, it can cause a whole lot of damage and a whole lot of loss, um, meaning there wouldn't be any of those fruit items to have. Uh, symptoms of the virus are usually mottled and distorted and mosaic-looking yellowing leaves. And sometimes that, those symptoms can also be seen on the fruits themselves. So another pest would be squash bugs. This is one of the most common things. Of course, squash bugs are going to affect all members of the cucurbit family. Um, and they're, they're sap suckers, basically, right? They just hook on to a pumpkin and hook on to a squash or hook on to the, the vine of those plants and suck away. They just love all of those sweet juices that those, that pumpkin is using to grow, right? The, the juices that the pumpkin is using, this, these bugs are taking away, which... Um, causes the plants to, to wilt and die. The adults of a squash bug are kind of maybe, oh, half an inch up to half an inch in size. And they're kind of a gray brown, almost, almost look like a pumpkin seed themselves if they were a, an ugly looking pumpkin seed, I guess. Um, but one thing you could do is scout for their eggs and their eggs are kind of a brick red color, usually laid in a cluster on the underside of a leaf. And then if you can get rid of the eggs, you can in smaller patches, you can kind of help that way. Otherwise, sometimes insecticide have to be used to help kind of stave that off. And pumpkins are so cool that everybody's doing research about pumpkins. <laughs> so pumpkins, um, current research includes heat tolerant varieties from Southern Illinois University. So this particular group of folks are looking at how they can make as our climate changes, I guess I should start with, as our climate changes and becomes hotter, just inherently, we we are starting to need crops to be able to adapt with that and, and still provide and still yield, even in these extraordinarily hot conditions. And pumpkins do fairly well in hot weather. We know that because we can grow them here in Pueblo and it's always hot here. Um, but some varieties tolerate the heat a little bit better than others. And so there's always that... Um, that issue, how do we make a heat tolerant variety and keep all of the benefits that, that a pumpkin might be able to have um, without, you know, if we breed for a particular thing, are we ousting other good things? So we're trying, they're trying to 
work on and think about how they can make it so that these pumpkins are heat tolerant and still viable. Uh, other studies include different nutritional studies. Like I said, they're really high in nutrition, um, lots of minerals and vitamins. And so how do we make this better? How do we, how do we grow them better to have more minerals and vitamins? Um, other research from North Mississippi Research and Extension Center are looking at disease and herbicide resistant varieties. So we just discussed some different diseases. If we can stave off diseases from a pumpkin just because they are inherently and in their genetics resistant to these diseases, we'll certainly not have to use as many um, chemicals uh, or we'll be able to still continue to have higher yields even in the face of disease or drought or all of these various things. Uh, herbicide resistance within pumpkins is also an essential thing. Again, to have to, in order to use less chemical pesticide, but still allow pumpkins to grow well without disease, without weed pressure, they'll have to acquire some sort of herbicide resistance. So all sorts of different places are working on um, different research areas and different aspects of pumpkins uh, so that we can have pumpkins for, for longer and more years. I think it's always fun just to include some fun facts. So um, oddly enough, the pumpkin, the name pumpkin was derived from the Greek word papon, meaning large melon. Right? And so this isn't, this is a word that, you know, Anglican settlers brought with them after they kind of Anglic Anglicanized it into pumpkin, right? And they saw the orange melon looking thing and said, oh, that looks like a melon we've seen, you know, and in Europe and the Mediterranean and and so kind of coined that name and coined that phrase uh, which was derived from the Greek. Um, pollination must occur the same day the pumpkin flowers. So pumpkins are monaceous plants meaning they have a boy flower and a girl flower on the same plant and so when the girl flower opens to be pollinated it's got to be pollinated that same day it opens otherwise unfortunately a fruit won't form. So pollination has to occur so got to get the bees working. Uh, this is the craziest thing. Pumpkins are 80 to 90% water. I couldn't even believe that when I, when I found that out. I mean, no wonder they're so heavy, <laughs> right? They're just, they're just full of water, but also that's great. You know, you can eat them and you can, you can get a lot of water out of that. That's why, you know, the cows like them. They're, that helps to hydrate the cows and hold it. Um, and of course, it, gosh, pumpkins wouldn't be a thing if we didn't have competitions on how large we can get them, right? So I guess the largest pumpkin ever recorded weighed 2,624 pounds, and that was grown in Belgium, Europe. Um, that's, a, that's a large pumpkin. That's a really big pumpkin. And then the flesh of pumpkins, of pumpkin, and their seeds are very, very nutritional, packed with antioxidants. And then uh, in the beta carotene, which is a vitamin A precursor. And that's the, the beta carotene is actually the, the thing that gives them their, their orange color. Once we start seeing different colors of pumpkins, um, like white pumpkins or something, we can often suggest that maybe there isn't as much beta carotene in those pumpkins. There might be some other vitamin derivative. Um, but the orange color is derived because of the beta carotene, which is the vitamin A derivative and part of the antioxidant family. Lots of good stuff going on with pumpkins. And we couldn't have a pumpkin class without telling the tale of how pumpkins started, how pumpkin carvings got started. So uh, people have making jack-o'-lanterns at Halloween for all sorts of time. And the practice really originated from an Irish myth about a man nicknamed Stingy Jack. And the legend says that when Jack died, he wasn't allowed to enter heaven or hell. So he just roams the earth as a ghost with only a burning coal and a carved out turnip to light his way. So there's the legend. And then the Irish kind of took that a bit further and they began to refer to his ghostly figure as Jack of the Lantern, which obviously and kind of more simply turned into Jack-o'-lantern. And then in Ireland and Scotland, people then began to make their own versions of Jack's Lantern by carving different faces into turnips or potatoes. So it started out with turnips and potatoes. And eventually when those folks wandered in, immigrated over to uh, the United States, 
they found pumpkins and they found that pumpkins were a bit easier to carve a larger uh, larger surface area not not quite as tough skin to get through um so pumpkin carving started like that And if you have any questions on what I've discussed today or want to learn more about pumpkins, please feel free to contact me. My contact info is in the little box. I'll leave it there for just a second if you want to copy it all down. Uh, but feel free to reach out anytime. I hope you enjoyed this quick information, little informational video on pumpkins. And uh, hope you get to carve your own pumpkin this, this Halloween. Check out some of these resources where I required some of the information from different university and extension websites. Thank you so much.